Hello, hello everybody. How are we doing? Uh, welcome back. Thank you for for joining me again. So today is my birthday, actually. So <laughs> I've decided to talk about an especially you know interesting and exciting topic. Something that is yeah really cool, and I'm very excited to to, to share with you guys, which is higher dimensions. You know, are they real? And if so, in what sense are they real? And do <laughs> you need to, you know, kind of uh, be crazy and schizophrenic to believe in higher dimensions? Or is there a way in which we can steal man or maybe titanium man, you know, higher dimensions? The answer is yes. <laughs> I do think higher dimensions are real. Now, the precise sense in which higher dimensions are real is non-trivial. So this is what this video is about. And hopefully by the end of it, you will, you know, not necessarily be convinced that there are higher dimensions, but at least take it seriously and, you know, pay attention in the, in the future if you get a, uh, to, to experience uh, some of these phenomena that I'm going to be talking about. But uh, to build up to it, actually, the, the quilly of the day today is numerology or like numerological correlations and correspondences you know i guess it's it's my birthday you know and and people take very seriously you know kind of the numerological implications of your birthday you know you add up your month and the days and the you know calendar year or maybe the calendar um of china and you know like or you know like kind of a tibetan correlations there's all sorts of things about like numerology you know adding up the the numbers of the letters in your war in your in your name and just the number of the, the the letters in your name and then like finding correspondences with other terms that also add up to the same thing all of that jazz well okay so who could possibly be interested in <laughs> in numbers to that extent um well i would say there's probably like three categories you know there is yes for sure kind of like people very into the occult maybe with kind of pareidolia or mental illness of some sort or you know people who experience way too many correlations you know in a sense that could be a overfitting disorder of perception would be one way of describing it uh, so that's one okay numerology matters for them other people who take very seriously the unique properties of numbers are mathematicians and uh, number theorists and uh, this is the first book of uh, john conway <laughs> the same guy as conway's game of life which uh, by the way if you look at interviews of him he's actually completely tired and and, uh, and and fed up with that talking about the the game of life because he oh my goodness his work is extraordinarily diverse and deep the game of life is just a tiny you know little side project he once did but no he's onto a lot of other really interesting exciting stuff and uh, this book is really cool because it's uh, yeah kind of like taking very seriously kind of a uh, you know in what way like numbers are special or not and like uh, specific numbers that show up all over the place like uh, as we will see in a second the number 17 may actually have very deep uh, important properties uh, that, that we will discuss in a bit um, so that's a that's another uh, category you know number theorists in particular people who study you know whole numbers and their relationships um, things like divisibility and you know modularity things of that sort who else? What the third cluster would actually be, I think, consciousness researchers who, yeah, I mean, tongue in cheek, they they blend to, to, you know, properties of the number theorists and people with schizophrenia who really care about, like, you know, number patterns and correspondences. Uh, no, I mean, I'm uh, I'm sort of joking, like, in, 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 uh, in reality, yeah, no, I think I can strongly steal men and I'll do this in this video. Why actually caring about numbers matters so much? So, um... In the meantime, actually, let me show you some magic numbers, you know, kind of like numbers that have a very special property. Uh, this sequence, 4, 6, 8, 9, 12, 16. I might even say this is the key or one of the keys to paradise, this uh, sequence of numbers. I, I know <laughs> it sounds like I have mental illness if I say, yeah, no, seriously, this is the, the key to, power, the, to heaven, the heaven realms. <laughs> you need these numbers. Uh, well, okay, you'll see why in a second. Um, okay, so that's numerology. <laughs> Hopefully you took note of that sequence. Now your gears are kind of like trying to figure out the patterns and correspondences. Why that sequence in particular? Well, here's the claim. That sequence is actually very important. <laughs> it actually is very special. <laughs> it's, it's quite unique. Now the, the puzzle is in what way? In what way? 
<laughs> okay, so the other kind of like very related, you know, quilly of the day. Well, I would actually, I'll probably make this a quilly of the day on another video to go deeper into it. But this this concept of philosophical toys. Uh, I really, really like that concept. Uh, the first person to actually come up with the idea of a philosophical toy as such is, um, uh, what is his name? Cyril Charles uh, Whitstone in 1826. He came up with this device called the Kaleidophone. And the Kaleidophone is, yeah, basically kind of a, a, a metallic stick with a, you know, a silver sphere at the top. And, uh, and basically it has like very cool resonant modes in two dimensions. So you can hit it with a stick specifically in different parts of it, or maybe like dampen it with your finger somewhere. And you will get like these really cool patterns, you know, like because it's moving really fast and its vibrational modes will, you know, manifest if you shine light on it. And uh, that's really cool. But what I find like especially awesome is that the inventor himself described it as a philosophical toy. So what does it mean? For something to be a philosophical toy i think that philosophical toys can you, you can steal men you know that yeah philosophical toys are probably pretty useful for exciting thought like basically vivifying imagination and forming a lot of connections yeah i mean it seems like a tiny trivial you know something here but i think this is like so deeply intimately connected with so many areas of life and the universe and everything that I think it deserves the name of a philosophical toy. But okay, what else is a philosophical toy? The more general version of this is called the harmonograph, uh, of which there are two kinds. There are like circular and what are they called? Lateral, rotary and lateral harmonographs, where basically you have two pendulums uh, feeding their oscillations into another pendulum. And depending on, you know, the specific like relative frequency between them um, and, you know, like the speed um, and things like that and the phase, you will get completely different shapes and the shapes tend to be really pretty and really cool. And I mean, this is like actually super profound. And uh, I'll, I'll see in a second, you know, when the frequencies are exactly the same, you get this thing that is a unison. Basically, yeah, it's kind of just a, a circle and really just depending on the relative phase of the two pendulum you will get like either a circle or a line. Uh, so that's a unison. Okay, so if you're seeing kind of like oscillations that look like that, yeah, you're, you can infer that there are two pendulums that are feeding into it and maybe they're out of phase or not, depending on, on the particular shape that happens. Uh, now, what happens when they are like in near unison? Well, then you get this family of alternative behaviors. Now, here is where this starts to connect with, yeah, like actually very deep philosophy and Qualia Research Institute paradigms that in a sense when you're close to unison where you're close to the same frequency as somebody else but not quite <laughs> then actually that gives rise to dissonance and some kind of stress and we can in a sense like yeah uh, there's a lot of uh, research that we're doing in that space so basically like misalignments actually causing you know here like with increasing degree of you know difference in the frequencies it becomes more and more erratic until you know it gets like this crazy mesh which is yeah um not particularly pleasantly looking you know it looks kind of uh, in disarray essentially um now um essentially what this also gives you is musical scales right because uh you can for example put two pendulums that are uh, at a ratio of frequency of one to two and then you will get this yeah basically uh an octave basically double frequency and you will get this yeah beautiful kind of like infinite shapes and depending on the phase you will get shapes of this sort again so if you see any of these shapes which are called lissajou uh shapes you can know it's two pendulums and they're in an octave of relationship and depending on the specific shape you can infer what the relative phase is between these two oscillators um but it gets even crazier i mean like you know rotary like if they're rotating you get like these other beautiful patterns um and uh and it gets like more more complex let me show you the uh kind of like the cheat cheat sheet i think is that what i'm what i'm calling it i mean essentially um yeah ordered by the level of dissonance in a sense which actually has to do with um as we'll see in a second this is uh, uh actually like a just the temperament notion of dissonance which is like okay how many of them are actually um 
in an integer relationship ratio such that the denominator is a small amount. So basically these are like the possible ratios of the frequencies. And you can see that the largest number in the ratios will be the one that determines how dissonant, how dissonant a particular shape is. And essentially these are ordered by a degree of dissonance, this one being lower dissonance, these ones being higher dissonance. And yeah, I mean, essentially, yeah, the, the, the higher the denominator, this would be nine because it's nine against eight and that fraction doesn't reduce further. You get, yeah, this kind of like very detailed and intricate, but still they're like integer ratios, right? Like they're not close to unison where it would actually become kind of this crazy mess. So even though, you know, this is not as consonant as the one on top, they're still fairly good. You know, they're still fairly good. Okay, so that is uh, the harmonograph and the caladophone. Okay, so uh, what about the numbers I, I was talking about? Well, okay, so it turns out those numbers in particular, you will see them, you will find them in ancient, you know, carvings and, uh, and, uh, and art, artwork uh, about the Pythagoreans. So this is art about the Pythagoreans. Um, you can see, for example, here, the sizes of the bells are in that relationship, like four, six, eight, nine, twelve, sixteen. And here are the lengths of the flutes or the size of the um, of the rocks, maybe the weight of the rocks that are making these uh, variously tense, uh, and and so on. So, why do these numbers show up in here? Like, what's going on? And uh, they seem to be across various mediums, right? So, here's the answer. <laughs> That particular set of numbers has a outstanding level of global consonants, meaning that the pairwise relationships between these numbers have uh, reduced fractions that give rise to denominators that are very small. So for example, four and eight, there is an octave of difference. Uh, they're in a one to two ratio. And then eight and 16, they're also in a one to two ratio. And now let me, uh, kind of like write it in a um, in a way that uh, kind of like shows all of those relationships again this is the sort of thing that yeah in a different context <laughs> you probably would judge me as being completely crazy uh, but yeah no, I mean uh, here he, here's what I'm talking about so and I'll, I'll explain in a second also like the the, the way in which I'm including information in this uh, diagram doopy doopy doo okay so Okay, so one way that I was playing with uh, earlier today that I found how to lay down these numbers in a very significant way is like this. So eight, like let's say the vertical direction is essentially octave relationships. So four, eight, 16. Six and 12 are also in an octave relationship. So those would be the most consonant relationships. So in this group, you have four octaves, four ways of generating an octave of consonants. Now, these double lines or double bonds are where the relationship is a three, where the, the, the denominator is a three, which could be two thirds or one third, either way. So you get kind of these like squiggly, like eight goes to, 11, uh, to 12, which goes to four, which goes to six, which goes to nine. And then like the, the more squiggly ones are relationships where the denominator reduces to four. And, uh, and that's about it. I mean, like there's also really like the, the black sheep in this set is basically nine because you know nine actually only reduces to essentially 16 <laughs> when it when it's connected to 16 um, and also it reduces to nine when you're connected with eight so uh, anyway nine here would be like the the one that causes more dissonance but also it adds a little bit of variety now um, that said yes I mean basically this kind of set is almost optimal at in a sense like using small integers that are like four or higher where you have like a non-trivial configuration that minimizes dissonance or maximizes the consonant relationships between them. And in that sense, it is a harmonious group. <laughs> okay, so that was cool. Now, what I did today, I guess it's part of my birthday celebration, a little side project, essentially, yeah, well, but yeah, I started doing numerology. So I wrote uh, a program where basically I was like searching through the space of possible, yeah, you know, sets of six numbers to find like others that also, in a sense, minimize some notion of consonance, of dissonance. And there's like various ways of doing that. I mean, like the, the, the objective function here, you know, it could be like adding up 
you know, and getting the mean for the denominators uh, the, of all of the pairs. Another one is maybe taking like the top, you know, 50% of the denominators and just looking at those. Another one is like taking the square root. Another one is like even, you know, squaring them. But basically there's like different priorities and actually which priority you have will depend. If you live in a geometric space, actually it, it maybe doesn't matter, you know, that there's like a few of those that are like very dissonant with one another because maybe you can put them further away, right? So they don't interfere very much. In, in a high dimensional space, everything will be interacting with everything. And in that sense, yeah, maybe actually what you want is like to reduce the average, you know? Then again, dissonance doesn't increase linearly as a function of the denominator, which actually justifies, you know, taking the square root. Anyway, uh, in most of the experiments, all of these measures were actually very highly correlated, meaning that, yeah, I mean, basically the, the, the whole consonance reinforces itself because, you know, it's every pair in a sense. So, um, yeah, yeah, basically if, uh, if a subset of the pairs, uh, they're correlated, it's a subset of, this, of, the, of the pairs are consonant that increases the probability that the remaining ones are also consonant. So, yeah, in a sense, all the measures are correlated, but the one that I ended up settling in was the average square root of the largest denominator. So basically very simple program, you know, actually just taking these like sets of numbers randomly sample, you know, with, with, uh, without replace replacement and then looking at what is their, their reduced fraction and then looking at the denominator. Okay. And then, okay. A little bit of intelligence into how to carve the combinatorial space so that you don't, you know, are <laughs> you're not wasting your time basically just sampling primes because a bunch of primes put together will not be very consonant for sure, at least in this notion of consonants uh, and harmony. So, um, well, here's a, a cool thing. So let me write it down. So uh, now, uh, yeah, and I found a few other numbers, uh, uh, you know, sets that were pretty good, actually. Um, uh, excuse me for a second. Some uh, ginger juice to, to carry me through this uh, pretty, pretty elaborate discussion. Uh, I also recommend, yeah, if you have a, uh, uh, yeah, having something to drink to, to keep your uh, mind sharp <laughs> as we get into this very crazy territory together. Okay. So um, now imagine, right? Like, so these, you know, these Pythagorean relationships, uh, maybe they're like kind of optimal for a brain like ours uh, in a normal state of consciousness, where in a sense, we can't really tell apart like denominators are like larger because they kind of just like blend the, the resolution of our experience is not very, not like that high. But what if you were, let's say kind of like an angel or like a divine being or something like that. And you had um, kind of like much higher resolution. You, you had like a much better ear and you could in a sense, like uh, rather than let's say like, you know, playing a symphony with like 60 instruments, you were playing it with like 600 instruments because you can detect all the complex relationships between them and, and, uh, or something of that sort. Okay. So, I was thinking like, okay, if you're some like an entity like that, maybe rather than finding like six, uh, you know, like numbers that are like very consonant with each other, why do we find 10? Okay, so I was exploring like 10 numbers uh, and I found out that the following one was actually really good. Like it, uh, it was like scoring the best in a bunch of uh, different um, metrics. So uh, here you have folks, you have uh, essentially, well, it's like four, five, six, eight, ten, uh, twelve, sixteen, uh, you know, twenty, twenty-four, thirty-two, you know, whatever. Okay, uh, I think I'm missing twelve in here. Sorry. So, um, well, uh, that one is uh, really good, and um, because you know, for the how large it gets, like thirty-two, and the fact that it's ten, it it actually is like really good in terms of like how consonant it is, you know, and. Uh, is, I think it's like the best out of a hundred thousand that, that I tried after even like carving the space. Now I'm sure there's like even better and maybe this is not the optimal metric, but you know, you do what you can. Okay. So, um, and uh, then I tried to arrange it in kind of like a, a, a scale musical sc or configuration, you know, where like you could see more clearly the correspondences between these numbers. So, um, and, and, uh, and here's what I, what I have. So essentially, uh, and, and the philosophy here is like, we, we've got to, uh, you know, like lay them out in a way that is actually insightful in a way that tells us that yeah, you look at it. And in a sense, like it gives you information, like the, the spatial layout gives you ordered information. So this is more or less how I am laying it out. So essentially the vertical 
axis all of a sudden becomes odd tapes. So 6 goes to 12, goes to 24. Again, <laughs> I know this looks completely crazy. <laughs> Numerological correspondences. Okay, so uh, getting back to it, 5 connects to 10, which connects to 20, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, 16 to 32. Um, now, let's say kind of like a slightly different color, hopefully this works, for, for example, relationships where the denominator reduces to 3. So that would be like this one. Uh, we also have, you know, 4 goes to 12. We also have like 8 goes to 12, 8 goes to 24, and 16 which is uh, pretty cool. Um, it's kind of like this squiggly thing. And the awesome thing about this layout is that you have kind of this mirror symmetry where in the right, what is like where the denominator reduces to three, in the left, it reduces to five. And uh, I'm going to represent that as a kind of like, oh, not this one, hopefully this one, like a squiggly, squiggly line. Okay, so, and it's essentially a mirror here. So uh basically 4 10 reduces to also like a denominator of 5 um 4 like 8 10 8 20 20 16 it also does that and uh, and another really cool relationship is horizontal so horizontal you actually have where the denominator reduces to 6 so essentially you you do this for all of the relationships that have high consonants and uh and it, it, it's a uh, pretty cool so let me just like quickly show you like what what happens so you get these you get these 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 uh, apologies i'm not really used to you know draw <laughs> live as it were uh but uh but yeah here we are so i'm i'm uh, almost done almost done uh getting there getting there so there's this one two this one Doo -doo. Doo -doo -doo. And I think, no, no, no. Uh, there's also, yeah. Well, this is roughly it. Um, oh, no, it's this one too. And you get uh, this shape. So, I don't know. I mean, it looks kind of cool. If, um, I mean, I'm sure it's like just random noise or something, but like if any of you find anything related to this shape please let me know it's just cool it's just like what emerged you know from the thought experiment of imagine there's like kind of like divine beings that can understand you know scales with more numbers and they play kind of divine music and uh what is kind of the shape of you know the scale that emerges something like this anyway i'm sure completely random you know but just just in case if any of you you know notices any relationship with anything else that exists already please please let me know in the comments okay uh so that was pretty cool something I was doing today um, which is yeah in a sense kind of steel manning all of these um, yeah numerological correlations and correspondences but from the point of view of actually valence you know combinations that feel really good really feel really feel really good together okay so um, what next well okay where do we get actually that um, you know an octave feels good when, when you have like a string and then a string that is twice the size when you plug them together why does that sound good okay so that is uh basically something that helmholtz uh figured out uh some people say <laughs> probably rightly that uh helmholtz was the last true polymath the last person who like truly was actually the most knowledgeable of every scientific subject of his time um at, simultaneously and uh, yeah, so basically he wrote books about everything. Uh, extremely brilliant guy. And, uh, and he figured out where dissonance and consonance come from in musical instruments. And the way he did it is amazing. It's basically, you know, when people have this aesthetic picture of sciences, like, no, you need kind of like a you know, bio lab and you need like supercomputers and, and like, you know, researchers with, uh, uh, yeah, like uh, basically like looking like a scientist with glasses and like a professor, like stuff like that. Well, no, Helmholtz revolutionized completely our understanding of music by doing kitchen experiments. Essentially, he, he would make these glass tubes and glass bubbles. And he literally has instructions in these pages about like how to use wax 
in order to put it into your ear and seal it properly <laughs> like it's all all sounds like super amateurish like you know not serious work right but but then it turns out that doing these filters the sound basically it works as a uh, narrow band filter where you get rid of all of the high frequencies and the low well frequencies above a certain level frequencies below a certain level and you get just a tiny fraction passing through and by doing that what he found was that uh, he was able to isolate for any given note, for example, in the piano, he was able to isolate um, all the ways in which uh, that note actually was made out of a fundamental frequency and the integer multiples of that fundamental frequency. Okay, so, um, and once he did that, then he was able to, in a sense, kind of like dissect <laughs> very carefully um, any sound that is produced by musical instruments and, and in a sense, figure out in what way there's kind of interference between these harmonics, these integer multiples. And uh, yeah, just like speaking very uh, simply, uh, if you think of a uh, basically a spectrum, uh, when you play a piano key, let's say this is like 200 hertz, you will have some amplitude, some intensity in the 200 hertz range. Then you will have also in the 400, then in the 600, 800, 1000, and so on. Uh, it kind of like decays slowly as you increase the frequency. And if you play an octave, you play twice the frequency. That is like playing something that starts here, jumps one harmonic, then moves another, like has amplitude over here, jumps another harmonic. But what you will notice is that the harmonics align perfectly they actually overlap. And when you have something that is in a relationship where there's like, you know, two to three, or like, you know, a, a fraction that reduces to a denominator of three, you will also have that relationship except that kind of like, it will align only partially. It will sometimes align, maybe I think like a, half of them or two thirds will align and then the other ones just will fall through. Um, and, and, and so on, as you increase the denominator, you will have less and less alignment but whenever you have, yeah, basically something that is in a whole integer relationship with each other, you will have some alignment. And with that some alignment, you will be preventing harmonics being close to each other, which as we saw in the harmonograph is exactly what generates uh, these problems, which in the case of sound, it's called beat patterns. Uh, for, for a lot of you, this is probably going to be, yeah, kind of like, just uh, just review of something you already know, but you know not not everybody knows this about the history of um, of music and our understanding of it. And uh, well, it turns out that whenever you have like two frequencies that are close together and you play them simultaneously, let's say these two frequencies, you will get beat patterns essentially and trigonometrically. You know when you have like two signs added together with a you know slightly different frequency that is trigonometrically equivalent to a cosine multiplied by a sine. Um, so that's kind of like you have like this way larger wave multiplied by a tiny one. So you get kind of this amplitude modulation. So you get like this like, woo, 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 which is basically, yeah, beat, beat patterns. And it turns out that the stronger the beat patterns are, the rougher the experience sounds, the rougher the, the, the sound becomes. So, um, and the relationship ends up being, I mean, something you can empirically test, and it has been done lots of times, uh, link in the description, but basically you have a relationship that looks like, uh, apologies, looks more or less like this. It's kind of like this sharp, skewed, kind of like long tail. So if the x-axis corresponds to the frequency difference, and the y-axis corresponds to the amount of dissonance. Well, for most frequencies, and this varies depending on the bass frequency a little bit, but basically you will have something that like, yeah, I mean, around like 10% difference, you will have like maximum dissonance. Um, again, it varies like for higher frequencies, this is smaller, for lower frequencies, this is larger. But the point is that there is kind of this, what's called crit critical band, that like if you have the frequencies too close together like that, 
the beat patterns are actually just noticeable and it becomes rough and you can't quite separate the two sounds from each other and they get confused in your perception. And if you look at the spectrum of a complex symphony uh, that is not trying to maximize dissonance and very few symphonies, even those that are very dissonant, for the most part, if they're well done, they will essentially, yeah, it's kind of like this jigsaw puzzle of how do you arrange the harmonics of all of these different instruments and all of these different amplitudes with their, you know, characteristic timbers in such a way that there is a spacing, enough spacing between them. And so, yeah, I mean, I recommend like taking a, your favorite symphony and put it on, you know, uh, Adobe Audition or something like that, or, or you know, just on Python and getting the spectrum. And you will see that, yeah, it's a work of art. Basically, the harmonics are kind of like laid out exactly in such a way that they don't interfere very much with one another, uh, which, yeah, it gives rise to tolerable, interesting textures of sound that are very rich and packed across the spectrum. So that is, I think, like, in a sense, musically speaking, key to understand for, for making sense of a musical, musical valence. Now, okay, so there's a, a additional information here to, to give you. Again, this is kind of a review for people who, who, who've studied music theory. But uh, yeah, there's this difference between just intonation and equal temperament, where in the just one is exactly kind of this Pythagorean uh, ideal of like, oh, let's put uh, the scale in such a way that they are perfect uh, you know, integer multiples of each other, or the the reduced fraction has a large denominator <laughs> uh, or small denominator. So when you do that, um, essentially the har harmonies are perfect. They are like completely perfect. And in a sense that does maximize valence and cleanliness of the sound, but it can be a little bit boring. We also there's also these like boredom power, uh, uh, boredom mechanism I've talked about in other videos. I recommend watching the symmetry theory valence presentation, uh, also linked in in the description. And uh, yeah, I mean basically, uh, if you listen to very simple patterns for long enough, you just get bored, and that's a dissonance of itself. Okay, uh, that's an insight that uh, Mike Johnson actually uh, came up with. Um, so, and, and that, that's one problem. The other problem is more serious, which is that they're just not very versatile. In a sense, if you compose music for a particular scale in the ju just intonation, uh, it will not generalize to other scales. Actually, you need to produce music specifically for specific scales and the instruments will be very finely tuned specifically for those scales as well, which is, yeah, kind of like a, a nightmare if you want to like modify music or use the same instrument to play many different kinds of song within the same night. You'll have to tune it again every single transition. So instead you also have equal temperament, which is uh, dividing an octave into 12 parts. And it just actually so happens that doing that division ends up being a fairly reasonable average consonance between the pair relationships of the notes. Um, and, uh, and that's basically what most of Western music is uh, based on, basically equal temperament because it's just so convenient, so easy to, to, to in a sense, like tune and play different songs with the same instrument, instrument in the same night. Um, now, uh, some people say that, yeah, this is kind of like, we are used to equal temperament. Uh, so much that like you realize that actually it's almost kind of like has a it's kind of like caffeine has a bit of a stimulating character because even like octaves well even like major fifths or like yeah these kind of uh relationships that should be perfectly harmonious in a sense they are not quite <laughs> and uh we get used to it that's kind of like what we 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 assume so if you listen to like just intonation music uh you can actually almost kind of like fall asleep sometimes because he's like, oh, this, the, 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 the background musical caffeine. I think that phrase comes from uh, Quentin, Quentin Freerix. Uh, uh, yeah, basically shows up. Okay, so now what? Well, an additional twist here is that um, this whole, you know, all of these music theory, all, you know, Pythagorean relationships and equal temperament and so on, all of it, is based around instruments that are what's called um, uh, harmonic, <laughs> which is instruments whose notes uh, have additional pure tones that are exactly integer multiples of each other. Now, this makes physical sense. When you have a string, yes, its resonant modes will actually be integer, be integer multiples of each other because it's a string, a one-dimensional string vibrating. Okay, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. 
it doesn't trivially generalize. It doesn't generalize to like two dimensions or three dimensions. Also, it doesn't generalize the, the music to like weirder instruments that, uh, for example, are synthetic or like, you know, if you use a synthesizer or something like that, or plain strange instruments, for example, tubular bells. The harmonic modes of tubular bells, or sorry, the resonant modes of tub tubular bells are not in a harmonic relationship. They are, it's an instrument that is called an inharmonic instrument. Um, so yeah, if you, if you put tubular bells in your piano, you know, in your, in your uh, digital piano, uh, I, f I, keep, I forget what, it, what it's called. If you do that and, um, uh, and you try to, to play harmonies and, and uh, chords, you will notice they're off and strange. So tubular bells are actually, it's very difficult to play with them uh, and, and write music for it, especially symphonic music, precisely because it's an inharmonic instrument. The other one is uh, xylophones that naturally, because of the shape of it, yeah, basically the resonant modes are not in a harmonic relationship. So naturally already there are like some instruments, exotic instruments admittedly, that are inharmonic and for which, you know, this music theory doesn't work. <laughs> and I, I do remember, okay, so like when I was uh, 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 younger, uh, in my early youth, uh, as, uh, as some would say, um, I used to take uh, piano classes and I was very frustrated, like learning these like musical scales because I didn't understand why. Why are they that way? You know, why do they skip the way they do? Like, it just seems arbitrary. And honestly, you know, my te the teachers there and nobody could explain to me why. They, they would say things like, oh yeah, music is very connected to math, but that seemed very, seemed very superficial. But right? it's like, it's actually just like learning kind of arithmetic. It's like, you're not getting an insight. You don't understand it. There's also a lot of illusory understanding. A lot of people who studied music theory and they think they understand why it works that way. <laughs> Actually, they just work, they just know how, you know, they, they know how to play with it, but not necessarily the deeper, deeper why. But yeah, the deeper why is, well, musical scales, one way of understanding is, is carving the space of sounds, carving that state space, such that the average pairwise or, or a triplet has a high degree of consonance, or at least, you know, the top 50% or 20% of relationships are very consonant such that you can produce music that has that consonant quality. Of course, it is beneficial if in your scales, you also have the source of some dissonance and some relationships that are very dissonant such that you can create tension and then relieve it. And yeah, that's a very important part of music. But if you don't have the consonant core, kind of the, the consonant kind of like large amount of the combinatorial space, um, in a sense like that actually will prevent you from producing like beautiful music. For the most part, you will be yeah, producing other, you know, more dissonance or noise based music. Okay. So, uh, what William Setheris, uh, did, who is a yeah, music theorist and mathematician, uh, also link in the description, he generalized music theory to also inharmonic instruments. And this is something that honestly you could only have done after the advent of, you know, computers. Why? <laughs> because the way in which he did this was via an, a genetic algorithm, where basically what he does is a little program computes the, you know, total dissonance of a particular sound constructed of pure tones. And it does it by, yeah, looking at the pairs wise relationships between them. And uh, then what it does is it tries to find a way of spacing the notes the frequencies such that you again get a good scale and a good scale will be defined as yeah that the average pairwise dissonance between the notes that you have available is minimized so for example tubular bells okay maybe a 12th you know tempered scale doesn't work <laughs> but maybe a 17th tempered scale does work really well because statistically speaking the harmonics align better okay hopefully hopefully this makes sense but you see this is a generalization of music theory, then we kind of like need to ask the question of, um, does this also generalize to other dimensions? Because as I was saying, all of this kind of music theory is based around one dimensional universe, like whether it's like tubes of air, columns of air or strings, um, you know, th things like that. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess percussions don't really count in, in that case, but yeah, uh, basically, um, you will have, exactly this issue that the resonant modes will tend to be multiples of each other. Um, but um, in other spaces, that may not be the case. So 
and and here is yeah basically uh, a very important kind of like foretaste of what am I going to be discussing at a greater depth uh, in this video and also later uh, is yeah the wallpaper symmetry groups. I talk about it in relation to uh, this effect in psychedelics that is called symmetrical pattern repetition, where you stare at a piece of, for example, your wall, a textured wall, you know, a statistical texture, and by staring at it, you, all of a sudden you will start to see kind of like copies of whatever is in your fovea, and the detail will spread in one of these arrangements. And in a sense, the, the symmetry will actually reinforce itself via resonance, uh, which is, yeah, I think something we can eventually prove is one of the important research paradigms that, yeah, basically when you have a wallpaper symmetry group appear in your visual field and psychedelics, that is a resonance effect. And you're actually getting the interlocking of resonant waves in several dimensions at once, such that their interference pattern gives rise to one of these symmetries. Okay, so all of a sudden, numerology again, right? Like the 17 wallpaper symmetry groups because they're mathematically constrained. Um, by the way, here's the other book by Conway, uh, The Symmetry of Things, uh, where, yeah, basically he explains and proves, well, this is a very well-known theorem. I think it's called the magic theorem. Uh, basically why there's only 17 wallpaper symmetry groups, two-dimensional ways of tessellating a, uh, sorry, two, uh, ways of tessellating a two-dimensional space with symmetry elements. And, uh, and more so, there's also a limited way when you include colors which you can think of it as another degree of freedom or, or, or dimension here. And, um, and these are all of them. Uh, these are all the colorations. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, in the real math and people who are interested in number theory and, and symmetry and so on. But for consciousness research, why does this matter? Well, they show up on psychedelics, but also <laughs> they're extremely related with beauty and valence. And why? right like this is so mysteriously beautiful it's like a existential puzzle <laughs> why why do these produce valence effects and uh yeah i mean as we will go into further basically these are harmonious ways of putting together resonant modes in a way that their interference actually is consonant so whenever you see something like this actually there's a signature of consonance in your uh in the resonant modes of your experiential field and for that reason, oh, by the way, there's also kind of a crazy duality uh, between uh, spatial symmetry and temporal synchrony that arises in these states, not only in psychedelics, also in meditation, uh, basically high energy states of consciousness. And, uh, and so also, if you see one of these <laughs> and it's very crisp and clear, it also means you have synchrony over time going on. It's not only that they are in a sense... Uh, yeah, it's, it's not only spatial symmetry, it's also temporal synchrony. Uh, because otherwise, they would be chaotic. You know, it would, they would be, you might be kind of like a, one of these unison type of thing. But like, no, if, if this is a stable pattern, maybe, you know, it's rotating or something like that. But the point is that the symmetry elements are preserved. Then, uh, yeah, you know, actually, it is a consonant relationship. And yes, also, again, you will have kind of these beautiful numerological correlations where... For example, this one is called 632 because it has a six rotational point, it has a two rotational point and a three rotational point. In a sense, you can characterize one of these symmetries in terms of what are the symmetry elements. And here, yeah, the rotational, six rotational is, for example, the um, the flower, you know, the kind of like six petal flower. You can rotate six times and it looks exactly the same. You can rotate the entire pattern six times and it looks exactly the same. And uh, the cool thing about this t-shirt is actually ordered by going from more simple with smaller numbers, which would be, in a sense, higher consonants, modulated by energy. So there's a wrinkle there, uh, it's complicated. But roughly speaking, for the same amount of energy, you will have higher consonants here and lower consonants, but all of them are beautiful. The same as the, the pictures I was showing you from the harmonograph. Yes, they're all in increasing dissonance, but the dissonance is, at the end of the day, relatively small because they're still in a harmonic relationship is not one of these like, you know, slightly off relationships or is not something even more chaotic, like a lot of off relationships <laughs> across different dimensions. Um, okay, so this is in two dimensions. Now you also have basically these things emerge in higher dimensions and uh, on DMT, <laughs> uh, I will explain, uh, basically that happens a lot. You actually experience uh, in one of the stages uh, between 
but yeah, what's called the Symmetry Hotel. You can watch my presentation at Harvard about hyperbolic geometry of the empty experiences. Yeah, basically between Symmetry Hotel and no, sorry, between Chrysanthemum and uh, uh, way, uh, and uh, and Magic Eye level, between Chrysanthemum and Magic Eye level, um, you have a whole layer where your whole experiential field is prone to, although it doesn't always necessarily do this, it's prone to generating three-dimensional space groups, which are this sort of thing, which is basically all the ways in which you can tessellate 3D space with symmetry elements. And uh, again, numerology, just as there were only 17 ways of doing it in 2D, there are, it turns out, 230 ways of doing it in 3D, uh, which is also really cool that like if you're experiencing one of those things on DMT, like you know for a fact that it has to be one of those. So then you can like go and, 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 and try to figure out which one. And by the way, we know already, thanks to like very systematic reports from a fellow you know, mathematician, psychonaut, that all of the wallpaper symmetry groups appear on psychedelics. And they all have this quality of like temporal uh, synchrony correlated with spatial symmetry. Yeah, I mean, uh, science will take a while to catch up to it. But yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, things that, uh, that we, we have uh, figured out. Um, okay, <laughs> so this, this has been a lot already. Uh, but now we are going to get actually into higher dimensions more concretely, for which I actually need to talk about space <laughs> and what is space. Um, um, well, there's many kinds of, you know, physical spaces that are higher dimensional. Uh, to begin with, a lot of people will claim, probably rightly, that the universe is not three dimensional, but is four dimensional. And, you know, if eternalism and, you know, general relativity holds up, essentially it's kind of like a block. It's like something that actually doesn't change. The change is illusory. The change is kind of in the gradient in one of those dimensions, the arrow of time, the increase of entropy. But all of that is already there. It's kind of like the, the existential canvas is already there. It's just just what it is. And uh, and we are one of the experiences there. Um, and um, so it is four dimensional at the very least, talking in terms of physics. Well. So a string theorist, you know, will come and say like, no, like it's not four dimensional. It's actually 11 dimensional because you need these additional compactified dimensions to explain, you know, the, the phenomena that we observe. Like, OK, fine. Sure. We live in an 11 dimensional space. And actually, there's like several more. <laughs> what David Pierce was uh, joking would be kind of a dimensional up one manship where, yeah, increasingly more uh, incredible and bizarre and sometimes horrifying philosophies uh, kind of like give you a perspective that no, the universe actually has way many more dimensions. And uh, some of the actual, you know, I, you know, actually very taken seriously in the literature of philosophy on quantum mechanics, uh, you know, there's like two very, very high dimensional perspectives on the universe, which is um, within the branch that's called, uh, no pun intended, within the branch that's called wave function realism where basically they say that, no, the thing that is real in the universe is actually the wave function, the thing that is evolving according to the Schrodinger equation. Um, well, that is real. And that, it turns out, is extremely high dimensional. And we are just kind of like a tiny sliver of it in a sense. And the three dimensions are actually illusory that we exist. So this uh, to our like configuration space realism, uh, this is where essentially what exists is a wave function of amplitude in a configuration space where like basically each point there corresponds to a configuration of the universe so which is like a 3n you know dimensional space because it's three dimensions times n where n is the number of particles in the universe so we're talking about like three times you know 10 to the 85 or something insane like that um, and that is the thing that is real and we think that we live in a four dimensional universe, but actually we just live in a tiny, you know, branching foliation of that space and, and it continues to branch. And uh, yeah, I mean, the future is actually underdetermined in this model. You will be in a sense in all of the possible futures from now on. Uh, and also the past is underdetermined, although a lot less than, than the future is. And then there's an even crazier one that I don't understand. It's called Hilbert space realism. And that confuses me a lot because my understanding is that Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. And I definitely don't want to go there. <laughs> I don't even 
believe in infinities to begin with, but okay. So that is uh, physical spaces, and yes, we can still mend that. I mean, in a sense, I, I, I do think, from what I have read, you know, the case that configurational space realism, uh, you know, is decent, has a decent chance of being true. I, I, I think that's 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 uh, correct. Um, but I also don't want to sound very confident because actually I don't I don't know the the, the details here. Uh, but yeah, basically that's just to steal man that, yeah, you know, physically speaking, there are higher dimensions. But uh, the ones that are actually most interesting to me and to our research efforts are high dimensions of consciousness. And this is, again, one of those things where, yeah, there's kind of like a meta contrarianism going on that like, yeah, people will take DMT, they come back and say, it was high dimensional. I went to a place that has many more dimensions than, than I'm used to. Then the normal, typical, sane, rational reaction is to say, no, you just were hallucinating. That's an illusion. You thought it was higher dimensional. <clears throat> no, they were just <clears throat> hallucinations. It was a feeling. Don't trust your feeling. And uh, to be you know, honest, that is like a decent thing to say because for other things, I think it actually does work. I mean, if, if I say like I saw, again, machine elves, I saw this mantis shrimp and they were telling me secrets and that uh, the CIA has a base in the moon, you probably, rationally, you should say, yeah, that was, you know, honestly a hallucination. And even though it felt very real, why do you trust the feeling of it? But <laughs> a recurring theme at QRI is to understand that there is a key difference between the semantic content, basically what the experience was about, and the phenomenal character, how it felt. And it's just that we don't have yet a culture of rational psychonauts that basically have come up with a very high quality mathematically grounded language to talk about the phenomenal character but we're getting there <laughs> i think these efforts actually do produce novel insights and perspectives and yeah i mean this is a work in progress obviously but uh i would say within the phenomenal character paradigm of phenomenology higher dimensional higher dimensional spaces are undeniable <laughs> they are absolutely real and after you finish this talk if you ever happen to take dmt which again asterisk asterisk you know there's dangers involved potentially i'm i'm anyway like there's many places where you can get scared off of psychedelics like just you know think of them like scientifically speaking uh and also you know dmt can be really beautiful as well anyway so if you do dmt vaporize dmt afterwards you will know, yes, you know, these higher dimensions are real and uh, like you will now understand actually what I'm talking about. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's freaking real, guys. It's a real thing. Like it's part of the state space of consciousness. It's just not widely understood or recognized for the time being. But yeah, the, the efforts, the sense making that I'm doing right now, hopefully is carving a path towards actually, you know, bringing this knowledge back from the gods into the human realm. Uh, well, very, uh, <laughs> very titanic vision right there. Uh, not necessarily endorsed, but okay. So kinds of space with regards to consciousness. And here, yeah, there's many kinds of spaces, even conceptually speaking, like there's conceptually distinct kinds of spaces. And um, the ones that I'll briefly mention is A, there is the state spaces of quilia varieties. And here again, the QRI logo becomes very relevant. Basically, this is a place, a state space that has been linearized, where basically the distance, the geometric distance between points in this space corresponds to the subjective distance, how different they feel. And that can be empirically created, investigated using this paradigm of just noticeable differences, where basically you take a color, uh, an RGB value, and then you modify it up to the point where a person starts actually being able to see a difference in an experiment and, and be correct about it, or at least let's say being 75% correct about it. You know, the threshold might depend from researcher to researcher, but yeah, basically something like 75%, you call it a just noticeable difference unit, and that becomes your ruler in this space. And it turns out if you do that, empirically, the state space of color is a 3D Euclidean space. And the same will happen for every other sensory modality and qualia even for like the quality of thought or the quality of time, there are just noticeable differences you could presumably do. And um, if you're more interested in this sort of uh, research, look into the 
uh, video that I uh, uploaded right before this one, which is, uh, um, uh, you know, new paradigms for researching consciousness. And uh, in there, yeah, basically, <laughs> I provided a lot of like really crazy new possibilities for how to do, yeah, just notice no noticeable difference mapping of more exotic things, like, for example, the sense of time by creating different phenomenal time experiences in each of the hemispheres. Anyway, it gets kind of crazy. It's not the topic of today, but uh, yeah, basically Quilia varieties. Now, here's something that right now I think a lot of people get wrong is in conventional neuroscience and, you know, computational neuroscience, philosophy of mind as well. Uh, there is a strand of people, also in conversation when I've talked to people who are very, very smart and who are like doing AI research, <laughs> they, they say things like, the reason why you know visual stimulation maps on to visual qualia is because the symmetries of the input uh, determine the qualia. In a sense, visual qualia is what it feels like to have an what is it like an S three you know symmetry group in the space that you're simulating or something like that. You know that's one perspective. Um, it's very interesting and compelling, and I absolutely do think that each sense modality <clears throat> and internal modalities uh, of experience, they do have inherent symmetries that are inherent to the particular quality of varieties in them. I mean, if you're using color, for example, yes, you will have like this, you know, you will inherit the symmetries of 3D Euclidean space. And yeah, that's uh, I think like fascinating. And yes, so in a sense, like quilias come with their own symmetries, but quilia varieties, but I think they have it backwards. I think it's more that platonically, actually, you know, eternally in, in a sense, these quilia varieties have that geometry. That's part of their inherent properties. And then that geometry, which has the beneficial symmetries that come from that geometry can be recruited for information processing purposes by biological organisms by instantiating them. But in a sense, it's kind of like you start out with a menu to begin with of possible quilias, which corresponds to particular, well, something like oscillations in the fields of physics, <laughs> if you take seriously, uh, yeah, you know, electromagnetic theories of consciousness and, and the sort of paradigms that we work with at QRI. Yeah, basically what you will have is that, yeah, those symmetries are inherently physical and are there, and they're kind of like up for grabs. If you're, you know, a complex physical system like the brain that, you know, has like genetic self-interest to reproduce, you know, it can use that in order to create a world simulation. And in a sense, the mapping between sensory input and the quilia variety will be precisely that, which essentially makes processing the input very easy and generating internal representations very natural. So the overall observation here, I would say, is that we are actually all synesthetic. Like the mapping is arbitrary but we are a special kind of very evolutionarily adaptive synesthist. You know, we have a synesthesia that is very adaptive. Like the fact that visual stimulation will map onto visual qualia is a, a movable parameter. If you have a different kind of synesthesia, you could experience actually just audio qualia from visual stimulation. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, uh, and you could survive. And actually that may even have like information processing advantages for tasks we didn't evolve to solve. And well, that opens up this whole place, this whole like field that I call designer synesthesia. Well, actually that term um, came up in a conversation with uh, Justin Shovelin, where I was, uh, <laughs> I, I was first exploring this, uh, this topic. And yeah, he, he offered the term uh, designer synesthesia, which uh, yeah, I absolutely love. And uh, yeah, in a sense, like understanding the symmetries of each of the quilia varieties will allow us to do designer synesthesia from first principles. Okay, so all of that is the space of Equilibrium variety, the state space of equilibrium variety. Again, to remind you, we're talking about things like this, the CLF space, uh, you know, tactile space and so on. Well, there's two other important senses. Uh, another one is the state space of consciousness, which is actually the space of possible experiences. You know, it's kind of configuration space in physics where each point in that space doesn't correspond to a color. It corresponds to an entire experience that has many different colors simultaneously and has many tactile sensations and, you know, audio and, and feelings and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that in just one point, because you know, there's a lot of dimensions that, in a sense, give you information about what that point means. So that is the state space of consciousness. And arguably, it is an insanely large state space. It's not something as simple as this. And I mean, not, I, I strongly suspect it's not a Euclidean space. 
it probably is complicated hyperbolic in some regions i'm sure it's not even homogeneous yeah yeah very very complex um and there's a third one which is the one that matters the most for this video which is the notion of phenomenal space and phenomenal space is the actual feeling of space the spatial correspondences in your experience and you know from steven lehar the shape of your experience is actually a kind of like this diorama shape it's not even perfectly euclidean it's actually has a weird variable scale where basically the things that are further away they look more euclidean and the things that are closer by essentially they look less euclidean they kind of have like more acute angles and and weird things like that uh, so even just like two cubes even though their sizes might be different in your visual field you can tell which one is closer not even because you have two eyes but because of the scale and basically whether the lines are parallel or not <laughs> uh, which is a fascinating you know kind of like yeah observation that that, that yeah basically perspective is encoded in in the scale and in the parallelism between between the lines um, so actually we we are simulating we're emulating a 3d euclidean space using this weird actually diorama like space that has variable scale but we can say roughly speaking it is three-dimensional we could arguably actually say it's a little bit more maybe it's like 3.2 dimensional or something like that because it has yeah kind of these like wrinkly hyperbolic structure towards the edges i'm not gonna get too deep into it you can look um welcoming stephen lehar to the qri paradigms is a, an article that delves deeper into uh, kind of yeah kind of his uh, frameworks and they're yeah very insightful for this thing okay so um and the geometry of the phenomenal space is the thing that i actually claim can be higher dimensional you can actually experience I'm not saying that you're communicating or becoming or connecting with a physical higher dimension. I'm not saying anything like that at all. And please don't misconstrue me as actually trying to suggest that. That is not at all <laughs> what I'm doing here. Um, rather, I'm saying that the geometry of your inner world simulation can acquire higher dimensions just as it can become hyperbolic as i've argued in uh yeah multiple places <laughs> uh yeah pretty, hopefully uh pretty compellingly uh because i think it's true actually <laughs> things that are true better be argued compellingly so um okay so um here here's the thing like what is the actual shape of an experience well the shape of an experience is uh kind of this weird thing that like if you kind of like put it into a graph you will see various kind of like clusters and let's say this is kind of like visual qualia and this is like audio qualia and tactile qualia and you will see local binding connections both you know within the modalities but i'm not going to be representing it right now and across the modalities okay and uh, let's say an experience this is super coarse grained but you could in principle you know describe an experience as okay what parts of each of the sensory modalities are hooked to one another and to themselves and in that way you can yeah in a sense represent synesthetic experiences and again we are already synesthetic right like we experience like audio visual tactile percepts all the time you know and uh, and it, they have like a coherent relationship and they're geometrically coherent um and they're multimodal, and they so they will show up as kind of these connections between these different uh modalities um so that is kind of the 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 shape of an experience now how given this um how about like higher dimensions okay so the first and most important thing to understand from this and actually i would say the most important thing from this entire video is that functionally speaking these are indeed higher dimensions but physically speaking they might be what we might call virtual dimensions that they're not actually physically instantiated as additional dimensions but rather they have the behavior of higher dimensions and therefore from within the energy flow follows the equations of higher dimensions and therefore it actually gets rendered experienced as higher dimensions and in that sense in some sense <laughs> it is as you know it is high dimensional and in the most real way that could possibly be which is actually an experiential higher dimensional like true experiential higher dimensional so to to get at this we have to talk about the trade-off between degrees of freedom and virtual dimensions so uh i don't think i've talked about this in this channel before 
so hopefully this is yeah pretty new for most of you if you have three separate planes each of them with a dot in them how many degrees of freedom do you have well the answer is you have six degrees of freedom why because being two-dimensional each of the dots have essentially you can describe where it is uh, in terms of two coordinates, you know, where they are in, in, in these coordinates. Um, well, uh, this is like six degrees of freedom. And in a very naive interpretation of what, uh, you know, the dimensionality of something is, you could say that's six dimensional, but that's not at all the way in which I'm conceptualizing dimensions here. Rather, think about it as imagine now that uh, rather than the three dots being completely independent, you in a sense, um, you uh, couple them, perhaps with resonance, <laughs> a very my favorite glue in this case. <laughs> Sorry, that sounded so so strange. Anyway, so <laughs> you couple them, let's say with resonance or with some other glue. Uh, but okay, you you couple them such that by moving one dot, the other ones move as well, and you could do this in such a way that functionally speaking, they are the three of them are emulating the behavior of a dot in three dimensions such that the three dots are projections of that dot in three dimensions. So these planes don't need to physically be embedded in a 3D space. You know, these planes could actually just be in a two-dimensional space. But if uh, with wires or resonance or something, you, you hook them up such that they emulate this behavior, well, that would be a virtual higher dimension. Okay, so and it would feel like that if, if you are this, you know, mathematical space. So, and, and here is the, the important uh, realization. The, the trade-off here is that if you want to get higher virtual dimensions, you will have to sacrifice degrees of freedom. So in a sense, they are, uh, you trade off one, one with the other. Uh, so, um, and uh, as we saw again with uh, the harmonograph, uh, what happens here? Uh, these are in a sense coupled oscillators. And in that sense, because they're adding kind of like their, you know, movement contribution in only one dimension, you can stack them together and the resulting oscillation will be of a higher dimension. Okay, so if you stack several of these and more so, uh, I mean, this is kind of tricky because you're only kind of like having one point. This, you also get this with a, an oscilloscope. But if it's moving fast enough or if there's kind of this decay constant where like impressions essentially slowly decay, then you can paint stuff, okay? You can render information. So here's what happens. Essentially, I think we can interpret the three spatial dimensions that we generally inhabit as in a sense being the result of kind of these very large number of finely tuned coupled oscillators such that they can, in a sense, as an oscilloscope, except a continuous one, um, actually render something in a space that functionally behaves as three-dimensional. Isn't that crazy? Okay, so um, how does this actually manifest in terms of, yeah, exotic states of consciousness? Well, to begin with, you know, again, you have like coupled resonant modes. So these also, in a sense, have kind of the signature of, of a slightly higher dimension. If you're experiencing um, actual like space groups, three-dimensional stuff, that would be higher dimension. But uh, there's also one specific way in which I would say uh, you can experience four spatial dimensions with one of them being a virtual dimension on DMT, uh, which is like very crisp and very clear. And if you get the experience, you will know exactly what I'm talking about and why this is real at a phenomenological level, which is that if you enter a room, for example, between uh, usually in, in the uh, magic eye level or maybe in, in waiting room level, I think in either you might experience this. No. Mostly magic eye, much magic eye level. So you can enter a room and I mean, already in lower levels, you know, the walls were tessellated with this sort of stuff, uh, you know, wallpaper groups. Um, if you are in the magic eye level and you enter a room and you look at the parallel walls, you will realize that not only are they covered with um, wallpaper symmetry groups, they are coupled and they are complementary so for example maybe the comma here is rotating in this direction and here is rotating in the other direction and if they change they change they change simultaneously and in a sense they are hooked up via resonance 
and they are generating this higher virtual dimension implicit in that behavior. Now you take slightly higher dose and maybe you go to the waiting room and you might experience kind of like an extra overlay of this room becoming kind of like a hypercube because you get an overlay of that cube together with the temporal tracer, the generalization of the tracers, uh, visual tracers on psychedelics uh, to overlay with itself. And it will also, in a sense, collapse into something that behaviorally is generating other virtual dimensions. And it's, this can be really crazy. I mean, I, I would estimate or guesstimate that at least you get like seven or eight dimensions in, in higher doses with a caveat that I'll explain in a second. But uh, the claim here in a way is that if you were to visualize again, kind of the, uh, the synesthesia that, that we have, uh, it's kind of like, yeah, this graph that crosses across uh, sensory modalities. As you increase the dose on DMT, you're actually kind of generating more and more edges and connecting it. You know, there's a very pretty picture. I think it's the, gonna be the thumbnail for, for this video of um, basically uh, your brain on mushrooms and, you know, functional connectivity between different regions of the brain. And yeah, basically becomes a more dense, dense graph. Okay, so, and that particular study also was essentially looking at, yeah, what, what's called a, a simplexes, which is the generalization of a triangle, <laughs> essentially fully connected subgraphs uh, that basically uh, here, like these four points are like fully connected, you know, every possible connection is there. And if this dot is connected to this other one, this would not be part of the simplex because you are actually lacking some connections. So they were doing kind of analysis of simplexes and, you know, simplexes are of different sizes. You know, if you have like eight dots fully connected, that would be an eight simplex, I believe. Well, uh, basically on mushrooms, you start to get lots of actually higher dimensional simplexes. Things start to become more fully connected. Uh, different regions of, of your, your brain starts to become yeah, more fully functionally connected. And, uh, and, uh, you know, at a rate that is higher than chance. So um, now here, uh, this is complicated, I'm sorry, but essentially as you're coming up on DMT, um, because of these video pairs well with, you know, psychedelics and the free energy principle. Uh, okay, so essentially there are two pre predominant energy sinks. So DMT will generally increase and energize the high frequency harmonics of your experience and things that, in a sense, suck that energy are both uh, symmetries, you know, consonant resonant modes, they're kind of like ground states, is another way of uh, looking at it, uh, or very similar to kind of like a sphere, uh, the, the shape of the sphere when you, when you leave a soap bubble, radiate all of the excess kinetic energy that it has, it just kind of like settles in its ground state. So these symmetries would be kind of local ground states. And the other one is semantic content. It's essentially things that you have previously experienced that you can have had like priors in order to interpret whatever your, 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 your qualia texture is, you know, you're, you're going to start to interpret it as semantic content that also sucks energy. And uh, in a sense, that's also kind of like why DMT becomes really crazy after a certain dose, where basically it's so energized that a, there's no representations that are that energized and B, because there's no such representations, um, you are not sinking a lot of energy and so it accumulates further. So you actually kind of do this jump, you know, this bifurcation where you take a little bit more and like, oh my gosh, there's a phase transition because there's a threshold where you, your energy sinks stop working, at least the, the typical semantic content. Uh, also why like in super high doses is pretty much yeah, all geometry. Uh, and also very relatedly, this is uh, another lens we could use here is the lens of competing clusters of coherence, which is especially the case on DMT, that you have essentially these like complex mathematical shapes that are competing for your attention. They're sending, phenomenologically speaking, waves of energy and trying to get in tune with one another. And <laughs> here's where a lot of the topics we've been talking about starts to wrap together um, and, uh, and uh, become part of, yeah, this interesting high entropy alloy of experience <laughs> uh, of itself, which is, uh, yeah, the Pythagorean numbers start to become relevant that because the particular shapes, whether they're like space groups or wallpaper symmetry groups or higher dimensional spaces or hyperbolic manifolds, any of those things, because they're emitting waves of energy with a signature, the timber 
of those symmetries, in a sense, that allows them to interlock and phase lock with other resonant systems within the experience that maybe have like slightly different frequencies or, you know, and, and, and from there, essentially, you will get the whole vibe of the space. So in a sense, <laughs> actually, what you're doing when you're in one of these exotic states of consciousness, you're trying to minimize dissonance, except that minimizing dissonance in such crazy high dimensional spaces looks like crazy competing clusters of coherence trying to harmonize with one another. Now, there's two gradients that you follow. I don't know, this is a lot of content is very crazy. <laughs> if I die tomorrow, I'm not going to die tomorrow. If I do, hopefully, <laughs> at least all of this is online. So uh, essentially, um, yeah, so um, uh, basically you have like, yeah, these like the, the reason why it becomes fractal is that the different shapes with the timbers, uh, individual timbers, in a sense, if they can mirror each other, they become perfect at predicting each other. So that creates evolutionary selection pressures for sameness in different scales and also climbing the harmonic gradient. In a sense, tuning or modifying or twisting or shearing these representations in such a way that they become more in tune with one another. Except that, you know, this we're way past kind of a Sethers and Helmholtz. We're in the terrain of high dimensional harmonic theory or, you know, very, very different but ultimately based on the same principles. And if the symmetry theory of valence is correct, this is actually the key to understand what underlies the beauty of paradise realms or heaven realms in, for example, the DMT space. The claim would be that you actually have frequency and resonance generators, which are the particular representations in your experience that are synesthetic, very synesthetic, again, like, you know, the, it's not just like, you know, this, your visual field vibrating here is your visual field coupled with a particular sound, coupled with a tactile feeling. And all of that is in one of these, you know, symmetrical relationships. It, it actually is instantiated a symmetry group, mathematically speaking. And it's emitting energy. It's emitting waves of energy within the experience that carry that timber, that high dimensional timber. And they get in tune with one another. And now because they're complex and synesthetic, they may you know, manifest as like entities or they manifest as what I call qualia creators or they manifest as like, you know, crazy tentacle branches that go across the visual hierarchy. Um, weird synesthetic stuff. But those are the generators of the resonant modes of your experience. And as a consequence, they are the, in a sense, the metronomes whose timbre you need to harmonize. Now, the vibe of the space we would claim would actually be the aggregate harmony of all of the representations within your experience. Um, uh, Mike Johnson also in particular, like he was suggesting that, yeah, basically uh, both Mike and Lehar arrived at this in insight independently, which was that each of these representations, yeah, basically have their own, uh, yeah, basically uh, there's a correspondence between shape and sound and is very deep, <laughs> actually shape and vibrational modes. Okay, so rather than, you know, four, six, eight, you know, nine, 12, 16, the Pythagorean, you know, sacred numbers, it's actually going to be something more complex. It's not going to be just numbers, although with numbers you could describe it. It's going to be, for example, a hexagon together with a, um, you know, 120 cell, which is a, you know, four dimensional dodecahedra together with this particular hyperbolic honeycomb together with like a weird cylinder thing with you know spinning colors and those things simultaneously they generate a beautiful vibe which is that as an aggregate there is a tremendous amount of consonants in their interrelationships and i think eventually we will hopefully get to the point where we can actually infer from first principles what do the heaven realms of DMT look like and feel like? Because we will know, you know, from a scientific point of view, actually, what are the, what is the wave equation that describes these particular resonant modes? And as a consequence, yeah, being able to derive what is actually the best vibe, what is the most heavenly, blissful, enlightened, liberating vibe that you can experience in DMT or otherwise. Um, 
uh so 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 yeah there's all of that i i also have kind of yeah this this vision imagine of a you and there's kind of these crazy things also like on dmt you enter these like space inhabited by a lot of let's say like you know monks that are also elves and they're all meditating and singing and chanting around like this hexagon shape or i don't know it looks like a high dimensional hexagon weird thingy and uh, and everybody is kind of like in tune with one another and there's like other things going on as well but like the hexagon is like there at the center and then like out of curiosity you go there and like you touch it or maybe you replace it by a pentagon and then everybody gets super upset and like re is like what why a pentagon why did, what are you doing <laughs> why no you just ruined everything and 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 that's because maybe that hexagon was actually load bearing for the consonants of the entire space and by replacing it by a pentagon or another high dimensional equivalent shape you are ruining everything basically in bad realms uh things just feel off you know these like in a lot of like literary um uh you know kind of like poetic description people say like yeah i was in such a bad mood that even you know my shoes looked off like or lovecraft you know like these weird horrible places yeah yeah in truth substitute the 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 hexagon with a pentagon and everything might feel off all of a sudden and it's going to be this deep weird spiritual mystery until you analyze it through the lens of you know musical generalized music and musical scales uh, for higher dimensions and other you know hyperbolic uh vibrational modes okay so other crazy things that happen on dmt that this explains so uh there's this phenomenon i call hyper edge capacitor which is that as you're coming up on dmt you will get this crazy amount of like correlations happen often at the center of the of, of the visual field and there's actually kind of a bifurcation depending on like how the experience evolves sometimes that ends up in a sense being laid out uh in space and uh, spread out and that is kind of a hyperbolic type of uh type of effect where in a sense you have like too many triangles in a shape like if you substitute triangles uh or like substitute a hexagon by a heptagon um, you have too many of those yeah it will start to get wrinkly and hyperbolic that's one thing that can happen that is one possible energy sink but the more crazy one is where you have as I was explaining rooms where the opposite walls have complementary movements and that but like stacked on one on top of one another and like all of these in a sense like energy that you're inputting into this complex vibrating high dimensional shape uh, is getting getting sucked in by further symmetries that you're finding within that object and so that's basically yeah what I call a hyper edge capacitor because the dimensionality of your experience and here we can describe the dimensionality of your experience as the highest dimension phenomenal object that you have within your experience when that is happening um, if you get to the hyper edge capacitor mode you will in a sense generate thought forms and perceptual objects that have very high dimensionality and those will dramatically influence how the rest of the experience unfolds because that yeah that dimensionality doesn't go away instantly it actually kind of continues to reshape experience and pr provide an energy sink uh anyway i'm <laughs> there's gonna be some awesome science and descriptions of this when when yeah we actually start to study this in a more more serious way with an open mind and rationality <laughs> uh, another crazy kind of like mathematical thing that happens here is uh, cw complexes which is basically yeah topologies that mix different dimensions so for example uh a tree you know maybe kind of has like this cylinder and then like lines to symbolize the branches and then the lines have kind of these planes um that are s uh, sticking to it so i mean who said that you can only work by sticking things of the same dimensionality right like now you, you actually are like much more free than that right so here's like a cylinder a decidedly three-dimensional object <laughs> then like the branches are like one-dimensional you know lines and then the leaves are like two-dimensional um i mean schematically yeah two-dimensional surfaces and so like they're these are like this is a, a cw complex topology like differently dimensional objects strung together in some complex shape well 
um, with the hyper edge capacitor that happens, except that it ends up being kind of this very crazy high dimensional tree where some kind of like root of the experience is very high dimensional in that it has these kind of like branches into slightly lower dimensional, which branches into slightly lower dimensional and so on. And, uh, and sometimes they reconnect um, and they, 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 they form paths and um, uh, yeah. And that generates so much of like the crazy narrative and the seemingly paradoxical state. Okay. Another thing is bistable images. So uh, bunny, sorry, duck rabbit illusion, where it kind of like flickers between one kind and the other. Well, uh, you can think of that as, in a sense, kind of the product space between these two pictures. In a sense, you're getting kind of this in-between state and that gives you one extra virtual dimension. Well, generally speaking, in most states of consciousness, you will kind of collapse into one or the other. But on psychedelics, actually the thing that gets kind of uh, energized is the possibility of experiencing the bistable percept in a more robust way so that you experience the duck and rabbit simultaneously in superposition and they're kind of like not as much in conflict or actually they are in conflict but there's just so much energy that you don't know where to put it and it ends up you know creating like superposing representation superimposing representations well in the hyper edge capacitor all of that is actually grounded on essentially dog rabbit type you know figure ground inversion illusions and you get a network of those and also that is why the state of consciousness has such a high degree of criticality because all of a sudden changing one interpretation in that network of duck rabbit, you know, bistable percepts that interpreting something in that network can propagate an interpretation to the rest of the network. So uh, in a sense, like tiny changes can have like very large scale cascade effects. And in that sense, yeah, it's a sense in which that state also has a high degree of criticality which gives rise to incredible state changes, very rapid movements, you know, from one kind of space to a completely different kind of space because you fix the particular subcomponent of the network and you collapse that interpretation and propagating that collapse to the rest of the experience. So yeah, that's another really crazy thing to say. Um, now uh, we're getting close to the end. Uh, what happens when you take very high doses? Well, again, Remember, there's a trade-off between dimensionality and uh, de degrees of freedom. So what happens when you start getting like all of the connections? Uh, obviously, this is much more of a 5-MeO DMT type experience, but on DMT as well, very common on very high doses, there's this thing called a whiteout uh, or like merging with the infinite or becoming one with God, becoming one with emptiness or pure space. Lots of stuff described in, in, those, in that language. Well, when you're getting so many connections, in a sense, the information is not encoded in what connections are there. The information starts to be encoded in what connections are not there. So when you're getting to kind of the region of the state space that is very, very highly interconnected, in a sense, the families of experiences are derived from what connections are missing. That's the flavor of those experiences. And when you get to kind of like near or complete connectivity, I suspect, yeah, there's basically a few discrete possible attractors that exist of this kind of like maximally connected brain state and uh, and yeah those essentially feel completely non-dual there's essentially no more points of reference and uh, it's in some sense you got the dimensionality to be as high as possible but in so doing you collapse all of your degrees of freedom and so, yes, in principle, you're like in a super high dimensional space, but you actually can't move. <laughs> There's no room left for you to do anything other than just being in that, you know, point like super high dimensional space. And uh, so that's another crazy thing. And uh, it's not exactly just higher dimensions because, yeah, lower degrees of freedom. Also, importantly, like there's also all kinds of crazy valence effects that arise in kind of that, you know, close to a fully connected state because for the most part like a fully connected state is going to be a very high valence configuration because it actually you know you get kind of the product of all the symmetries of all of the sense modalities at once which will create something that might be a kind of like monster group this like incredibly strange holographic super symmetrical thing that yeah basically inherits the symmetries of all of the sense modalities at once um and i think that's a uh, 
almost everything like I'll, I'll mention that yeah all of these discussions on kind of like exotic experiences of aliens with exotic vibes oh the other thing too is that if you end up in a hyperbolic configuration then also there's kind of like a non-trivial music theory here because uh the waves of energy and the medium is going to be hyperbolic and basically that changes resonant modes and also changes the rules of harmony so <laughs> There's music specifically, you know, that you can compose specifically for hyperbolic spaces and the rules are slightly different. And uh, basically also, yeah, the valence of a hyperbolic DMT experience, whatever its dimensionality, will have kind of a hyperbolic signature to it, uh, which, yeah, it's a part of what makes it such an alien type of emotion palette. Uh, very difficult to communicate why it's so weird and exotic. Um, uh, importantly, I mean, and this idea of like, is this an illusion or not? Well, yeah, one of the key effects of something like DMT is that the resolution that you have in your visual field at the fovea actually propagates to the rest of the experience. So actually you, you end up having something that has very high resolution everywhere. And in that sense, yeah, you know, when, when you say like, yeah, and I was perceiving like 17 bubbles is like, well, sure, like, were you able to count them? And if so, like, how do you know it was that many? Well, because you got the gestalt of 17 and it was crystal clear. And on top of that, you were experiencing the vibe of 17 in that particular dimensionality. And so there's kind of like a, a, a consilience between several ways of understanding your state of consciousness. Um, and yes, importantly, to as you increase the valence in one of these states of consciousness, you can do that either by moving in the gradient of the vibe, which is kind of agnostic about the generators, or you can examine the generators and try to purify them, make, it, make them more symmetrical or more harmonious with one another. They both work. Ideally, you combine both. And uh, you can, I think, actually somewhat reliably uh, arrive at one of the heaven realms of DMT. Uh, <laughs> not, I'm not gonna say like, try this at home or anything like that. It's just like, you know, scientifically very interesting that, uh, you know, there might actually be quite a bit of control that we can gain here. And uh, in a sense, the, the key to paradise ends up being a kind of like weird generalized music theory for consciousness. <laughs> uh, the, the thing I will leave you with is that uh, several of these uh, kind of like sense modalities or streams in a sense, uh, uh, phenomenal spaces are more abstract. For example, the space of meaning uh, and symbolism. And, uh, and I would claim that, yeah, I mean, basically when people experience something as very meaningful, actually that is like consonance between like several of these like more abstract modalities that you have kind of like narrative path internal representations with their own kind of like music theory. You will have like, you know, your own feelings with their own music theory. You also have like, you know, if you're in a church or in a beautiful place, I don't know, a place that arouses the spirituality in you, uh, I don't know, Burning Man, <laughs> whatever it may be. Uh, yeah, and all of the symmetries that you inherit from that. And then all of a sudden you're having this very meaningful experience because there's resonance between these sense modalities. And yeah, I mean, something that this would predict is that you can actually mess up with somebody's resonance in strange ways, like playing the wrong music. And that might, you know, mess not only how good they're feeling from the point of view of audio, their audio valence, but also how they feel in terms of meaning how their meaning valence is like oddly off. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think all of this can be empirically examined and yeah, verified and studied more deeply. Uh, I think uh, that's about it. The, the, the last, last thing I'll leave you with is that, uh, yeah, William Sether is, as I was explaining, generalizing essentially music theory to in the harmonic instruments. Um, that is called Sino music with a X. Zeno is kind of like alien or like outsider or like the other. So Zeno music is the whole study of in like basically musical scales for inharmonic instruments or more exotic instruments. And there's like many more exotic instruments I, I'll probably talk about in, a, in another video. Um, well, the thing that uh, I would say at QRI we're kind of uh, proposing or championing or the lens by which you can reinterpret all of this video is Zeno valence meaning new ways of, in a sense, experiencing high valence states of consciousness with non-standard primitives, but not doing it <laughs> kind of a, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, basically not doing it at random. I mean, the, the, some intelligence when it comes to like the, the 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 heuristics you use to explore the state space, and also the fact that yeah, I mean, it's uh, grounded in ultimately something like yeah, the mathematics of consonants, but for higher dimensions and hyperbolic spaces. So with that, <laughs> I hope to see you uh, again, perhaps in one of those exotic sino uh configurations of consciousness. And if not, then in another video, another time, on another topic. All right, infinite please, and thank you so much for tuning in. Ciao. <laughs>